So once again, I want to welcome you to uh, this uh, lecture. We're going to be looking at network address translation and try to understand why do we even need to you know, translate our addresses? Why is it important? And why should we even look at it as security engineers? Shouldn't it be a concept that uh, network engineers uh, should be you know, concerning themselves with? Why are we bothered with it? So we want to look at network address translation and try to understand some of a few concepts as far as network translation is concerned. So um, moving forward, uh, network address translation translates an IP address. Let me get my uh, pen here. We are saying that it translates uh, uh, IP address uh, carried in the header of an IPv4 packet into an IP, another IP address. Generally, a NAT is used to translate IP addresses into public IP addresses so that devices can communicate across private and public addresses. To solve the public IP address shortage caused by the internet expansion, NAT emerged as a temporary solution. As you have uh, uh, upon completion of this course, you'll be able to recognize NAT application scenarios, understand how NAT works, and also configure uh, network address translation on firewalls. So let us look at the NAT principle. You are aware that for any device to be in position to access the internet or communicate with other devices on the internet, you must have a public IP address, right? But these public IP addresses must be purchased from internet service providers. Uh, not everyone has the capability to purchase this I uh, ISP. Even if they did, they are also not enough for let's say every uh, employee in the organization who is going to access the internet, the enterprise go ahead, uh, goes ahead and you know, procures or buys IP address, public IP addresses for those different individuals and organization. So that means that the public IP addresses are not enough and they are short in nature. So the network engineers or the people that came before us thought about it and they're like, you know what? We need to really think of how best we can come up with a, uh, 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 with a way of making sure that, you know, we, we, we have it not really enough, but we have public IP addresses that can cater almost for all the needs of uh, our connectivity for today. We also have what you're calling private IP addresses and you hear like private IP addresses, these uh, IP addresses are, you know, are assigned to private hosts on the network. I can have the same IP addresses like you. Many of you have computers 192.168.0.1 uh, or .1.0 within that range of class C. David, your hand is up. We are saying that as more and more IP addresses are being requested, um, the driven part in the internet is rapid growth because people are, you know, uh, every single day, I have a device that is connecting to the internet and it's also requesting for an IP address. You have a laptop, you could even be having a phone at the same time, a tablet at the same time, your TV, your fridge, like almost all the devices are requesting for IP addresses. Your cameras, if you have cameras installed, your DVRs, you know, you all have all those kinds of devices and all of them are requesting for IP addresses. So uh, because the internet has rapidly grown and today this has become a major challenge. So to address this challenge uh, that engineers thought and they'd be like, you know what, let us, you know, try and come up with what we are calling IP uh, version six. We come up with IP version six to, you know, to be the successor of IP version four. Uh, just in comparison to IP version four, which is defined as an IP of uh, 32 bits. So you have our IP version four. Uh, and we are saying for it, IP version four, someone who 
wanted to get to know the differences. I think you're paying attention yesterday you asked, has 32 bit value. Whereas IP version six has a 128 and 28 bits value. Now these bits are the ones which can you be used to determine how many number of usable IP addresses that we can drive from these, you know, uh, IP versions. So for network applications, uh, IP version six has a significantly larger address space as compared to IP version four. But now like you are aware, IP version six has not really been has not yet been really rolled out because of its way it, it, it has to be rolled out and also also the costs associated with uh, rolling out IP version six. So that's why uh, uh, it, it still has a long way to go and it cannot immediately completely replace IP version four. So this leaves us with an issue because IP version six will not directly or completely replace IP version four, certain workarounds are required to extend the use of IP version four. And for example, people decided to come up with what we are calling the CIDR or what some people call the classless interdomain routing, or maybe also the variable uh, length subnet mask, the VLSM. And then lastly, the NAT technology to help us find a way how best we can reuse uh, public, uh, private IP addresses. Now, I've talked of pub private IP addresses and pri private IP addresses are used to implement address reuse. That in my organization A, I can have the same range of I pub private IP addresses and there's no conflict on the network, even when I go on the network because my net addresses are going to somehow be translated into the public IP and we shall be seeing how. So they're not going to be affected in any way you also in your organization can have. There are so many chances that my private IP addresses on my computer I'm using right now, so many of the people in this class have the same IP address assigned to your device or something close or something even the same network. Uh, it could be 192.168.1.1 uh, or 0 0.1, depending on the route I'm connected to and depending on the network I'm connected to. But basically, uh, private IP addresses give us the capability of uh, having the ability to reuse private IP address. This gives us an opportunity uh, that we don't exhaust IP addresses, that they can be reused. In my home, I can reuse them, you can reuse them. Anyone else out there in the world can reuse the private IP addresses. This helps us to increase the utilization of IP addresses and uh, we have, according to our uh, request for comments, uh, we, it was able to categorize uh, 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 IP addresses in private IP addresses in classes, right? Now, the people who did networking on this class, how many classes do we have in private IP addresses? Say mic check and talk to us. Classes. Check. Check. Yeah, three classes. Yeah, three classes. Thank you. Uh, we have class. Class A. Class A. Ten dot zero dot zero network. Then class B. The one seven two dot sixteen network. Then class C. One nine two dot one six eight network. Okay. Then class C. The one nine two dot one six eight dot. Dot zero. Uh, a, B, and C. All right. Thank you. You can mute your microphones. You are very good people. I've seen all of you have muted your microphones. So yes, uh, these people decided to come up with different classes and also to see how best you know IP addresses or private IP addresses can be reused. As you can see, uh, we we have class A and class A starts from the range of ten. Dot zero dot zero dot zero to ten dot two five five dot two five five dot two five five dot two five five, and uh, if you are going to denote it in a classless or the variable length, it will be forward slash eight. The network engineers, could you tell us why we are forward slashing it with eight? Uh, slash eight is two five five dot zero dot zero dot zero. Uh. 
Okay. Mic check. Yes, please. Mic check. Be, be, because when you look at IP version four, it is made up of uh, four octets. The mm -hmm. Very good. First four octet is eight bits, and that's why we are using a slash eight because that's a subnet map. Oh, mic check. Yes, Martin. Yeah. Uh, Eight is the prefix length of uh, class A, and eight represents the first octet in uh, of uh, the subnet mask. Okay, it represents which uh, bits exactly? Is it the network bits or the host bits? Mike, check it. Yes, it please. Re uh, it represents the network bits. It represents the network bits. The network and the rest three octets represents the host bits. And the remaining octets represent the host, host. the host bits. Okay. All right. So, uh, whereas class B starts from one nine two, sorry, one seven two dot sixteen dot zero dot zero, uh, to one seven two dot three one dot two five five dot two five five, and it has a forward slash of. Sixteen. That's a forward slash of sixteen. Why sixteen? Because the first two octets represents the network ID. The first two octets represent the network ID to make their network sixteen bits. Mm -hmm. And we have class C, which says from one nine two dot one six eight dot zero dot zero to one nine two dot one six eight dot two five five dot two five five, and the forward slash is. 24. 24. 24. Why? Because the first three, three octets the three represents octets the represent the network bit. Represent the network bit. And for those who are wondering, octets, we have those bits. Let's say, let me just draw them and put zeros one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is the first octave. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Second octave. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Second octave. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The fourth octave. So the first one, all these bits are turned on. They are ones, right? Class A. And that's why we are saying yes. that the first eight bits, and we are notating it with eight, it represents the network bits on class A. But we since we are not in a networking class, we shall not go into the details, but we shall just focus on our area of interest. But I just wanted to give you a brief recap. What we are trying to say here is that private addresses are used on private you know, networks, whereas public addresses are used on public networks. And like I told you, for your device to be able to communicate, it must one, either have a public IP address or two, its private address must be translated into a public IP address. Does that allow, so to, does that make sense? Eh? So to, communi to allow communications between private and public addresses, we must use some kind of network address translation uh, and NAT must be used to translate the addresses if you want to be able to have a successful communication over the internet. So IPv version four, like we are aware, they are depleted. Almost everyone today has a device and these devices are all assigned IP addresses. Uh, IP uh, version six cannot completely replace IP version four. We, we have agreed. And uh, technologies to mitigate IP version four address exhaustion, we use technologies like network address translation, uh, we use uh, the CIDR notation. We can also use the variable length subnet mask. But in this course, we want to purely focus on network address translation. So the advantages of network address translation is that when you're using uh, network address translation, you can be able to reuse your IP addresses. So, um, uh, just to add on uh, address reuse, 
NAT continues to, you know, to evolve and also it provides other advantages, just basically not just to using the IP addresses, but it also gives us other advantages. Like you can know, uh, numerous hosts on our network or on the local area network can use a few public addresses there. One, you are saving cost because remember all the public IP addresses, you must be able to procure them from an internet service provider. So you are saving resources and uh, uh, you can use these few public addresses to access external resources through the internet or through the World Wide Web. Also file transfer protocol and internet services can be used by external networks. So uh, internal and external network users are unaware of the IP address translation. It is completely transparent to the users. They don't know what is taking place. They don't even want to concern. All you need to do, open your phone, uh, put on your data, start browsing, or open your computer, make sure your Wi-Fi or your cable is connected, and then start browsing. And you don't want even to concern yourself with the entire process that is taking place. For you, you just open and you are completely unaware of the process that is taking place. So we are saying it is transparent to the end users. There's of course also privacy. Uh, privacy protection is available to internal users uh, because uh, and the protection is provided for all the internal network uh, users. External network users cannot directly obtain the IP address of your machine because remember your IP address, your private IP address has been translated, it has been nutted. And those guys are seeing the nutted uh, kind of IP address. So they are completely or they cannot be able to know exactly your IP address. So even if when they want to initiate an attack, it's not going to be as simple as that because there's some kind of privacy protection. So they cannot directly obtain the IP address and service information of your internal network users. Then of course you can have multiple internal servers can be configured for load balancing uh, and, and also reducing the pressure of each server in case you have uh, heavy traffic. The disadvantage, um, it is hard to monitor traffic uh, or your network monitoring traffic is hard because remember now, uh, you don't know if you may be monitoring traffic for an entire data center, which has like in different locations, hard for you to tell uh, this exact particular user from this particular machine, if at all their addresses have been nutted. And of course, also some applications are restricted. You must assign public IP addresses directly to them, because if you don't, it will be hard for you to directly go ahead and nut uh, your uh, those kind of applications. So what is the basic principle? We want to look at the basic principle and try to understand how NAT is able to translate the, uh, how NAT is able to, you know, translate our private IP addresses into the public IP addresses. So network address translation translates the source and destination IP address in the packet headers so that numerous private addresses can access the public network through a number of public addresses, or even it could be through one public ad IP address, as you will see later on. So here is just an illustration that you have your destination IP address. Uh, this is where you want to send the things. You want to send the things to 123.3.2.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.3.
is uh, 123.2.1. And this is going to be now the source IP of this particular machine or our firewall. So as you can see, our firewall here is going to translate a destination IP address into a pub, uh, public IP address. It has already concealed even the source where it's coming from and even where it is going. It's going to show so the destination IP address, it is 10, uh, sorry, here when the packet is coming back. So it's going to translate and then it's going to be able to send the packet. So the packet goes and reaches here. This guy receives it. And for him, he's seeing that the source IP address is this, which has been translated. And the destination IP address is this for the NAT device, which is going to do the NAT. So this is the destination, which is our public IP. It's going to send to this. And then when this guy receives it, he will go ahead and translate it back to and change it and say, okay, our destination IP is now our private IP. So let me trans, tra, you know, translate it. And now our source is coming from our HTTP server. So it has translated it accordingly. So we have uh, categories uh, of uh, NAT and we want to look at them. NAT is divided into three categories based on either and where you want to apply it on the application scenarios. We have source NAT and source NAT has two uh, subcategories inside. We have uh, address pool mode and we also have outbound interface addresses or what some people call is the IP. And also we have server uh, mapping which is also some people call static uh, static mapping or NAT server. So let us look at source NAT. Source NAT here, we are going to look at it in details, but basically it enables multiple private network users to access the internet at the same time. Multiple private users to access the internet at the same time. Whereas in address pool here, which is a first subcategory, remember I enabling multiple private users to access the internet at the same time. In this mode here, the public addresses in the address pool are used to translate users IP addresses. So you have a public pool of, you have a pool of uh, address pool of public addresses and they're using those addresses to translate users private addresses. This mode applies when many private users access the internet. We also have the easy IP or what we are calling outbound interface. Like you hear the word outbound interface. This one is concerning with the interface. And we are saying uh, if the IP addresses of the internal hosts are translated into the public address of an outbound interface on the public network. On that interface, which you configure to be your outbound and you assign it an IP addresses. So all the IP addresses of the internal hosts, they are translated into that public IP address. And this mode applies when the public IP ad address is dynamically allocated, let's say by your ISP. And so you don't have to, to, to go and you know, configure an address pool. And then lastly, uh, server mapping or what you're calling static mapping or NAT server. Um, here it maps one private address. It maps one private address to one public address. One private address to one public address. This mode applies when public network users access servers on private networks. In case you had your FTP server, right? And you want to access it. You, do, you don't want it to be dynamic because you need to be able to reference it by IP address. So you assign one private address to conceal it but then you map this private address to one public address, okay? So whenever I access this public address, I'm directly accessing the private address of my FTP server. And we're going to look at them in details. Let us look at SourceNAT. SourceNAT, like we said, it translates the source IP addresses. Uh, those are the hosts in our internal network. Uh, the IP packet header into our public addresses. And this enables uh, several people on our network called hosts on our network to access external resources through limited public addresses and effectively hide the host IP addresses on our LAN. So that it's going to help us hide our IP addresses on our LAN. Uh, people there, hackers, they're unable to be able to you know, uh, access our you know, details. So we want to look at the first mode. We said it was the address pool mode without port translation. 
And the address pool mode here, um, uh, without port translation, is uh, implemented when using NAT address pool that contains multiple public IP addresses. We have gone ahead and we have procured, uh, we have procured, you know, our IP addresses. Let's say we have about one, two, three in our address pool, and we have many IP, multiple IP addresses. But here, only one IP address are translated, and only one private address is mapped to one to one public address. So if all addresses, like you can see here in our pool, are allocated, then that cannot be performed for the remaining other hosts on the network. Like in this example, we have our first private IP address, we have our second one, we have our third one, we have our fourth one. The first one will be mapped to this public IP address and boom, this person will go ahead and access whatever they want to access on the internet. Also, this guy will be mapped to this public IP address and he will be able to access the internet and also IP address 192.168.1.3 will be mapped to this uh, public IP address of 155.133.87.3 and he'll be able to access the internet. So what happens when IP 168.1.4 wants to access the internet because we are using port address mode without port translation and we said only one private address is mapped to one public IP address and we no longer have other available public addresses in our pool. So these packets are going to be discarded and this guy will have to wait until the pool has available public IP addresses. This is how uh, address pool mode without port translation is performed. Let us also look at address pool mode with port translation. So address pool mode with port translation is implemented using a, a NAT address pool that contains either one or you can even have more public IP addresses. So addresses and port numbers are both translated so that private addresses share either one or more public addresses. So because addresses and port numbers are both translated, we can have multiple users on a private network sharing one public IP address to access the internet. And also the firewall or any other NATing device can distinguish users based on port numbers. So numerous users can access the internet at the same time. Uh, so uh, theoretically, uh, since this uh, technology uses layer four uh, information of uh, and, and layer three, uh, that is because port addressing is done in a transport layer, it's done at layer four, and also uh, at layer three addresses, the IP addresses, we can have about 65,535 private addresses that can be translated into one IP address. That is theoretically speaking. And because uh, we have 65, uh, 535 ports available for each address. So here, the device can map the data packets from different private addresses to different port numbers on one public IP addresses. So when you have, we compare this kind of uh, uh, addressing with the previous one or the one-to-one -one or multi-to-multi, -multi, this mode helps us to greatly improve address utilization and that's why this pool with port translation is today commonly most used. So we have our IP address, just like you can say, we can have different IP addresses that are mapped to the same public IP, but different port numbers are used to implement. We have our source port here. And when, when we are sending a packet, let's say we want to send it to, this is our IP address of 192.168.0.1. 11 and want to send it to our destination of uh, 111. So what is going to happen? It's going to translate our source at the same time also translate our port and then give it a public and also give it a port uh, translation and then it will send it to the destination. And in an example, you can see here that different addresses are mapped to the same IP addresses but different port numbers to implement many to many address translation. Like you can see, we have our private address one, two, and three, uh, 192.168.1.1. And it can be translated. We have our public IP address. As you can see, this is the same public IP address. But what is changing, if you pay attention, we are going to also just keep on 
translating our ports. So I have translated the ports. We have given it port 711, 7112, 7113. And we are, you know, leveraging on one public IP address, but we're also using port translation to achieve network address translation. So as illustrated here, as you can see, we have different ports that we can use to translate our ports. We said we also have another uh, way in, uh, in uh, SourceNet, which we said the outbound interface address mode. And as you said here, we use it when our public IP address is dynamic. We said we use it when our public IP address is dynamic. So in this mode, um, uh, this IP, easy IP translates private addresses into the public address of the outbound interface. And without the need of configuring NAT address pools, you can just configure the outbound interface. And addresses and port numbers are both translated so that the private addresses share public addresses of outbound interfaces. I hope that is, uh, uh, that is clear. So we have uh, you go ahead and uh, create an outbound interface, you configure it and whatever you know source is coming, it's going to be translated into that outbound interface like you can see. And it's also going to use the analogy, uh, same analogy like that of port translation. So um, what to look at uh, NAT ALG. Uh, NAT ALG is what we're calling the application level gateway and uh, is a translation proxy used for certain application protocols and can translate addresses and port number carried in application layer. So for it, it goes ahead and also looks at how it can be able to translate uh, applications that are also carried in application layer. And it can use uh, uh, protocols like the ASPF, we looked at it and uh, it is, uh, it helps, uh, you know, in uh, implementing forwarding policy of the application layer protocol. It also helps to analyze our application layer packets and also applies corresponding packet filtering rule. So also NatLG helps us to, you know, uh, do the same and they help us to work together with the uh, ASPF so that we can run one command to enable uh, both those functions to work concurrently. So the implementation of the NAT application level, uh, uh, of the application level gateway, we have uh, the NAT and we are saying here with the NAT, let me, oh, sorry. We are saying that um, the NAT ALG application in the FTP mode. What happens here? We have our private network, we have our, public network. So the communication is set up. We have a set up control communication between the host and the FTP server. This is my IP address. I want to access the IP address of the server. 8888.1, this is my host IP address. So I want to access that guy and then a control connection is set up between those two. At this point, the host sends a port packet and says, oh, my port is going to be 10.84 and then ALG application uh, level gateway is going to start the processing and then the payload of the port packet can be now translated into that and then it is sent to the FTP server. It is at this point that the FTP server uh, initiates a data connection to the host. It also says, okay, uh, you say the your details are there. Also my source is this, this is my port. And uh, I'm going to translate this and then translate also that into that port, which you translated and gave to me. And then it's going to send it back and the FTP server is going to initiate also a data connection uh, to, uh, to the host uh, using those details and say, okay, if you want to reach me, I'm on that port and I know you are now on that port. And AOG is the one doing all that kind of processing. So transmit data over then after the establishment is done then uh, data can start be transmitted over a data connection so we want to look at server mapping we said server mapping or sometimes we call it static uh, static mapping or uh, NAT server so the NAT server functions as a public ip address to represent the private address of an internal server so we have the real address here uh, for our web server. Let's say it's 192.168.1.1. This is our real server. But we have the IP, uh, public IP address of uh, 
uh, 202.202.11.1.1. So what is going to happen when an external server wants to access our our server here? He is going to uh, send um, you know his source IP address, which will be his IP address. But the destination, it's as if he's accessing this. But when it gets to our NAT device or our uh, our our, it could be a router, it could be a firewall. When it gets to that device, and it will translate because for it, it knows the real IP address, which is mapped to our web server and then it will translate it to the original destination IP address to that. So on the firewall, a public IP address is configured to represent the server's private address and external users can access a server through the public IP address. But our internal network is sealed. Okay, so people are unaware or they are unaware. So it helps us to support, you know, our security zones. It also helps us to conceal the, you know, the internal architecture of our of our you know servers so it also helps us to protect us from possible potential attacks so NAT server and map server table this is basically what you see when you open your firewall and you type in NAT server server protocol tcp and you're able to see some of these things so the tcp is a protocol carried over ip and uh, this is the post NAT a uh, public ip address this is the pri private ip address so when you see global it refers to the post NAT IP address. This is the protocol used when you see inside, it refers to the public IP address. So one example here is basically, this is just an example, like NAT server, you go ahead and, uh, you know, say any, uh, it's showing you just a type, uh, uh, any, it's coming from this, which is, uh, uh, this is what inside, which was supposed to be that. This was either zone trust, untrust or DMZ or even local. We use the protocol of that and the VPN type, da, 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 da. So basically these are just a different values that you can get when after running that command. Um, uh, continuing to that, you can use the word no reverse uh, to specify and only to make sure that the device generates only forward server map entries. It doesn't, you know, generate reverse server map entries. So you can use the word no reverse to make sure that the device generates only forward server map entries. So you can just go ahead and type in the same NAT server, you specify those details, and then in the, at the end of the day, you specify and say no reverse. When you specify no reverse, the reversing packets will not be captured. Now, this is an example of what is returned after running this command. And as you can see, this is brief as compared to this. This one also has a reverse packet, which is showing you, okay, uh, coming from the server, I am from 192.111, and I'm accessing this is going to be my public and then blah, blah, blah. We also have a, a reverse packet. But when you specify and say no reverse, then uh, uh, only forward server map entries are generated. So application scenarios, um, application scenarios, we, we, we can have a typical, we can, we, depending on what you want to apply, but you can apply the, uh, the source NAT, if you have maybe, let's say, one public IP address and you want your all your end users and then you do a source NAT with address pool with uh, port translation. Well, if you have like five of them and you only have like a few users, you can do without port translation, depending on what you want to achieve as either a network engineer or a security engineer. Whereas with a NAT server, you have your, you know, you have your, let's say, a firewall somewhere or your data center and you want to access it so you can go ahead and assign it one public IP address so that whenever your end users want to access it, they can access uh, that, that device. And of course, it's uh, also its public IP address is translated to its uh, private IP address. So, uh source NAT configuration on the firewall web i will share this material and request you to just go ahead and play with some of these things because it doesn't make sense to for me to talk about them they are more doable than talking about them just go ahead open your firewall web gui by the end of today i'll share the video and the tools uh ensp good enough some of you have been able to download them those who have not yet downloaded them it's okay I will share them. Those who can set them up, go ahead and set them up. Those who cannot, no worries. Just go through the material and follow some of those videos that I will uh, share after the class. But this is basically how you can configure the NAT policy, 
go to your NAT, add NAT policy, then go ahead and specify the name, uh, either choose whether it's going to be in trust zone or untrust zone, and then blah, 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 go ahead and specify the policy. So uh, the security zone is usually the zone where the pre-NAT private IP addresses resides. Uh, so, and the destination security zone is usually the zone where the post NAT addresses of the public ad IP addresses reside. And usually that is the untrust zone. So our private goes in the trust zone. Our public goes in the untrust zone because the trust zone is the to be protected network, meaning you're, you're accessing the, the, net, the internet or other external networks. The trust zone, the, sorry, the trust zone is the to be protected. Uh, this is the network you're protecting yourself from the the the, the untrust the untrust zone and then you go ahead and choose either you're going to use outbound interface or you have an ip addresses in your ip address pool so um moving forward uh basically so you go ahead and configure your uh, public ip your private ip uh, just either specify the protocols you want, either TCP and then specify the port numbers and then choose whether you want to allow the server to use the public IP address for internet access. And then you can go ahead and configure some of those different things if you want to. So the internal address is the IP address of an internal server on the LAN, whereas the NAT, uh, the external address is the public IP address that the internal server provides to the external user. So you can configure inter-security zones. Basically, just go to your firewall, choose uh, security policy. We looked at these things when you're looking at policy, security policies, eh? and then you go ahead and configure the forward policy. And uh, source NAT configuration on a firewall. Uh, this is where you go if you want to, you know, if you're not doing the web GUI and you want to do the command line, just go in your firewall, type in that address group one. After that, you specify it, go ahead, give it a public IP address range. It's going to range from two up to six. Go ahead and also configure the NAT policy, give it the NAT rule name, and then give it a trust zone, specify the destination, the IP address, and then you, you know, you give the action or what, what you want your NAT to do. This is when you're configuring an internal web and FTP servers, when you're going to do static uh, mapping or NAT server, you also, you can read through this material. Basically, they are just showing you how you can configure those things on the command line. Eh? So, what to look at the application scenarios. You can apply NAT server plus source NAT, or you can also use intrazone NAT. So, intrazone twice NAT, to simplify the configuration of the route of a server to a public network, you can configure source NAT based on the NAT function. In a NAT server configuration, usually the internal server can send the response packet only after the routing or the route destination to the public is configured. To simplify configuration without configuring the route destination of the public address, you can configure the firewall to translate the source IP address to external users and the source address after NAT must be on the same network segment as a private address on, of the internal user. And this way, the internal server sends the response packet to the device by default, and then the device then forwards the packets. So you can go ahead, as you can see, we have our internal server. This is the real uh, address, and then you, your device performs some kind of address, and it's going to translate it to this. But you can notice this guy is within the same network as the real address, right? That way, uh, these guys can communicate and they can be able to establish the communication. On your NAT device, it could be a firewall. You have your public IP address, and then it goes ahead. And as you can see, we have done twice NAT. This guy's IP address is translated into this IP address, and this address is then now translated into our private address on the device. So that is what we're calling twice intrazone NAT. And this public IP address now can translate into the real IP address, and then we can have successful trans successful packets to, uh, uh, moving from one end to another. Intrazone twice NAT, uh, the file will translate the destination addresses of users' request packets into the private address of the FTP server. It also translates the source address into the public address of the user. 
So here the firewall can translate the source IP address of the response packet from the FTP server into the public address. It also translates the destination address uh, into the private address of the user. We have our internal user here with his IP address of 192.168.105. And this is a server's public IP address of 202.202.1.1. So it's going to go ahead and translate it into the user's public IP address. And you can notice the user's public IP address is also within the same network range of that of the server's public IP address. And then we have a successful communication and also the user's um, our IP address will go ahead and translate it into now the 192.168.1.1, which is a private network. So this brings us here. I'm not going to uh, put a poll, but I'll just ask you which of the following reasons, uh, uh, which of the following are reasons why not emerged? Which of the followings are the reasons why not emerged? Mike check. Mic check, A. A, and B. A and B. A. A and B, James is saying A and B, okay. All right, so I will not take a lot of time on that. We say it because there were insufficient addresses, uh, these guys decided to come up with that. Also, they said apart from just reusing addresses, it helps us to protect our real IP addresses or the real IP addresses of our internal users. So it is A and B. All right, so that brings us to the end of uh, this chapter, the end of this slide that we have looked at the technical principle of NAT, NAT application scenarios and the typical NAT configurations on the firewalls. So thank you. And I would love to...